Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us from wherever you may be this morning or afternoon or evening, like Elizabeth said. Um, my name is Alex. How did you do so? And I'm part of the Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples and Evaluation TIG. And um, we are excited to have um, Stephen here to present Decolonizing Evaluation in Africa, Some Uncomfortable Truth. Um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, throughout the session, we'll be monitoring that and he'll be answering questions as we go along. Um, please also let us know if you have any um, questions and technical issues. And I will let Stephen take it away. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, so my name is Stephen Mashaure. Um, I work for the Center for Learning on Evaluation and Results in Anglophone Africa. Uh, we are based at the University of um, U, um, Witzwaderstrand in South Africa, Johannesburg. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today um, is something that probably some of you already know. Uh, we normally call it decolonizing evaluation, or probably you've seen it in some other form when people talk about uh, made in Africa evaluation. So I'm just going to be talking about some issues that I feel probably they need to be highlighted. Um, so that um, we we can actually make evaluation actually um, a useful tool, especially for international development. So what I'm going to be talking about is based on a, on a special edition um, that I co-edited on um, Made in Africa Evaluation. It was published by um, African Evaluation Journal. Um, I think it's uh, we've got 12 papers in the, in the special edition and um, they actually have got some interesting tech on decolonizing evaluation and also indigenous knowledge systems. So they touched quite a number of things around what around evaluation. And it was published uh, during the first week of, uh, of September. So the objective of the paper is actually, we, uh, what I'm trying to do is to reshape the thinking uh, around international development and evaluation. Um, because you cannot talk about evaluation without talking about international development. So that's uh, that's the main what the main um, objective of the paper to just um, reshaping the thinking around um, international development. So so the paper that I'm going to be presenting is go, I'm going to, is structured in four sections. The first one I'm just going to be talking a little bit about colonial history uh, and its implication on what on development. Um, because quite a lot of people these days they want to forget about colonial history and then just move on to the present without actually understanding in terms of um, the, the implications of colonial history. Then I'm also going to talk about post-colonial development and evaluation. Um, this is the, the stage where we are in. Um, and then I'll move on to Made in Africa evaluation, just to introduce it, to see, to, to say what, what is it that we want to achieve. And then I'll talk about um, recommendations. So let me start by uh, talking about um, colonialism. Um, so I think all of us, we know what happened um, in the 18th and 19th, 19th century, um, especially in what in the African space. I think there are only two countries that were not colonized uh, out of the 52 countries that we have in Africa. And most of them, they were colonized by the British and, um, and the Americans, a few by the Germans, um, uh, the British and the French, uh, not Americans, and, uh, and, and the Germans. So the mode of colonialism was actually that Africa was more of a continent um, that was supposed to be supplying human, physical, and economic resources. Um, so there was no intention of actually developing industries in what in Africa. Uh, there was no intention to let Africa industrialize so that it can actually be what self-sustainable. The, 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 the main, the key issue was actually to say, you provide raw materials for industries in Europe, and then that's it. Uh, and when you talk about industries that produces raw materials, we are talking about uh, primary industries that do not need any technology or uh, quite a lot of what sophisticated what equipment. So, so that was the model uh, that was actually being done by uh, that was uh, that was being used by um, by the uh, by the colonial masters. Um, and also, the colonial system was more of what commodity based. Um, uh, it, it it was more of building those networks that actually produces what commodities that actually feed to um uh, to the colonial industries so 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 that kind of model you will find out that um it actually became difficult for us to actually shake it off and say 
we are actually progressing in a in a in a different what in a different uh, trajectory. Why? Because um, I can give an example like um, Zimbabwe is mining platinum, DRC is mining uh, lithium, but all those kind of uh, raw materials they are never processed actually in what in those particular countries. They are actually shipped to European countries where they are actually processed, and then they what and then they produce specific products that are sent back to African countries at a higher price. So you find out that um, we, we, as countries, we end up just what producing those raw materials, even gold, diamonds, they go and process, they go outside the country to be processed, and then they come back as finished products. So which means that we lose that critical uh, source of, uh, of of revenue for for the government for them to actually what um, to uh, to make money. So so it's, it's it's one of the it's one of the key issues there. And then um, the key implications now is that uh, because the issue was actually focusing on Africa as, um, as a producer of raw materials, you'll find out that even the way um, universities, our education systems, the way they were actually primed um, is more of us as what, um, it, it was viewing us more as what, as laborers, not necessarily as thinkers, people who can sit down and think. Um, about our issues and our problems. We were actually looking up to other countries to say, we got this kind of particular um, problem, who can actually help us to solve it? So, so and, and when you go to most of the universities, you'll find out that um, the curriculum, uh, even the, the teaching about evaluation is actually Eurocentric. Um, it's actually based on Euro, Eurocentric th theories. Um, you can talk about uh, theories of our uh, theories of development, um, most of them, they actually failed in Africa. So, so you find out that our thinking now, we, we, we don't think as Africans, but we think as what, um, as Europeans, uh, trying to solve what African problems. So, so, so it, what, it, what it did was that it, it made us to lose our epistemic freedom. So African people are no longer able to think, theorize, interpret the world, and write from where they are actually located. So you find out that um, if I can propose a specific methodology um, that is actually based on my understanding of the communities that I live in, in most cases, it can be what it can be frowned upon. Why? Because it does not comply with the European way of what of thinking. So, so it's one of what it's one of the one of the key issues. Um, so, so you find out that even our our knowledge, our values, our thoughts and procedures. They are all aligned to what to Eurocentric approaches. The moment you introduce an African way of doing things, people uh, view you in a specific um, with, with a specific eye. But but we know that um, uh, we have our own knowledge systems. We have our own values that influence how we actually look at what at development. And then the, uh, the the third thing that actually happened with what with colonialism was actually it created um, what I would like to call asymmetric uh, relationship between the West and sub-Saharan countries. And I think everyone else in the world they know it that um, sub-Saharan African countries they are actually viewed as the receivers of aid, while least um, uh, the global North is actually received as the leaders in what in almost everything. So, so, so that kind of a relationship it it means that we are actually dependent on what on um on what whatever comes from from the global North, and also there's that what we call the continuance of the colonial power matrix. Um, that is the coloniality of power. I will talk about it a little bit more. But what I just want to say is that um I think the current thinking is that. Um, especially by people from the global north. They just think that because colonialism ended 50 years ago, then we are not supposed to be talking about it. The current problems are because of what of the current leaders. But they don't actually look in terms of uh, the implication of, uh, of colonization on our thinking, on our economies, on, 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 also on how we actually what we do things. I, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more in the next uh, slide. So let's talk about post-colonial development and evaluation. So I want to start by talking about the, the Western hegemony on what on development and evaluation. Uh, and I think this is quite interesting because when, uh, when you look in terms of the, uh, the share of development funding that is coming into Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you find out that most of, uh, most, of the, most of the funding is coming from the Global North. You can even include uh, state funding on development and everything. You find out that uh, the percentage that the state is actually contributing uh, to 
a number of development programs that they are actually running is far less than what is coming from uh, from uh, from multi uh, multilateral institutions, your UN agencies, and also non-governmental organizations, and even uh, government departments from the from the global north. So it's it's actually it's it's more like the lion's share is coming from from the global north, but it has got Im Im implications. Then um, the the second issue is that the funders control the priorities. And, and I think this is, a, is one of the biggest, what, one of the biggest problem. So when I'm saying priorities, I'm just, I just mean like, um, like for example, I'll give you a very good example. At times I'm, I'm engaged to evaluate a specific problem. And for me, for my side, as someone else who lives in Africa, who knows what, what is actually happening in the development space, I always ask, um, what was your problem that we're trying to address here? And you find out that whatever that organization was trying to address is not necessarily a problem according to the people who are receiving that development aid. So, you, you, so, so it means that the priority that was actually decided by the funder is not necessarily the priority for, for the beneficiaries of that particular program. And then when you do an evaluation now to tell them, but you are not addressing a, an issue in, in this particular community, because the community, they don't view whatever you're trying to do as, what, as a problem, then it becomes what it also becomes a problem. So, so, so the priorities for development interventions is actually a race with, with the global north. The conceptualization is also done in the global north. The design also done in the global north. Implementation is highly controlled by the global north and also the evaluation. And I'm going to talk about the evaluation a little, a little bit more. How is it controlled by the global north? So, so you find out that um, that is in terms of the development space. So the evaluation space is also a microcosm of the African development space to say that most of the evaluators who are actually evaluating programs that are being implemented or funded from the global north are normally evaluators from the global north and uh, with very little um, involvement of the local people yeah, who are working in, in those particular communities. So, so you find out that um, in a national development organizations, they, they, they act as, um, as proxies. Um, of the Western epistemological hegemony. So, so, so this is what happens. You find out that I think from the 1950s, when you go back to history, we are, we are still witnessing the same problems. If it is poverty, if it is lack of clean water, if it is inequality, if it is poor education, poor development outcomes, we are still witnessing them, despite the fact that there's been quite large resources that has actually been uh, invested in to address those particular problems. So you only see just a few countries, probably like South Africa, but South Africa has got also its own problems of inequality and poverty. Um, you find out that the, the problem is still the same. They are still there. They are not going away. So, so when, 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 when someone else is still addressing problems that were identified 40 years ago and significant resources have been actually invested in it, then why is that problem still, at, still available? It goes back to evaluation to say, what are, what are the evaluators actually telling the people who are funding or implementing these particular pro, um, programs? Because um, you should reach a specific point where you say, uh, enough is enough, let me just say the truth. But the issues that the methodologies that are being uh, used now um, um, are, not what, um, are not able to pick up the key challenges that are actually there. So I can give an example, especially in, in terms of these particular uh, issues. You'll find out that uh, an organization that provides humanitarian aid, let's say in terms of addressing food security, has been working in the same community for more than 20 years. It's no longer humanitarian aid because they need, they need to actually have a sustainable program that addresses that particular challenge, but uh, it's not actually happening. Um, so so you find also find out that the funders, although they are diverse and um, heterogeneous at times, you find out that they are guided by the same principles and same approach. We know this for international non-governmental organizations, UN agencies, they all use the same approach. So you find also that majority of decision makers in international development are from the West. When I'm saying decision makers, I mean even to change implementation strategy. You find out that the local people who are doing the implementation can't change it without actually consulting um, the international funders. Then you also find out that the commissioners of evaluation from the global north, let's say it's an, a, it's an international non-governmental non organization, probably based in the Netherlands. Um, they prefer evaluators from the global north. That's, the, that's one thing that normally happens. 
and and this is quite uh, quite very simple. Uh, if you look in terms of most of the evaluation evaluations done in the African space by international development organization, you find out that the lead evaluator is actually from much from the global north. Um, so why are they being engaged? Because of what of their perceived skills, and then the the appointed evaluators also prefer the methodologies that are either dictated to them by the commissioners or those that are aligned with the what Western epistemological underpinnings. So you find out that the room to change is very limited. Why? Because the system is actually again uh, is actually um, against actually localization of of evaluation, if I may say so. So then, when it comes to program implementation, this is one of the key challenges that is, that that is always there, and I don't know how it's supposed to be addressed. So there's the, there's an individual or a person who is called a technical backstop. So let me just uh, explain what we, we, what it is. So you find out that let's say there's um there's an international non-governmental organization operating a decentralized system. They got a local unit in a in an African country. You will find out that um, if they get funding, let's say from the United States government to implement a specific program in that particular country, that international non-governmental organization will actually hire locals to do the implementation. You might actually have people like uh, the chief of party, the technical advisors, or people who are coming from the what from the um, uh, from the uh, from, from the community where the where the project is actually being implemented. But those people are actually controlled by what we call the technical backstops, and in most cases, the technical backstops are the people who actually develop the proposal, and these people are actually based outside what outside the country. And they lead in program design, program implementation, and evaluation. So it's more like they control each and every aspect of the, of, of the program or project. So what it means is that even if the local people are doing the implementation, they pick up something that can actually um, require to change the design of the program. They are, in most cases, they will have to pass it through the technical backstop. We can actually say, no, we can't change the program now. Um, but these are the local people who are doing the implementation at the local level. They understand the context in which they're doing the implementation. And it also goes back to evaluation. When you try to nominate an evaluator, you find out that the overall approval comes so much from the technical backstop. So you find that in the end, you find an evaluator who, is not, who, who doesn't understand the local conditions, who actually comes from the global north for 20 days to do the evaluation and goes back, and then that's it. So, so you find out that it, it, it becomes a problem where um, even if local people are doing the implementation, they don't have control over the design, the implementation itself, the monitoring itself, and the evaluation of, of that particular program. So, so what it does now is that um, this is what uh, Gacheni said in 2015. Africa is largely a product of active operations of colonial matrices of power that were well-funded as invisible in various design, designs. Those, those particular designs, they actually perpetuate uh, the colonial approach to development in Africa. So I'm just going to talk about coloniality of power in evaluations next. So coloniality of power, um, it was said so by Maudonado Torres in 2007. It refers to long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that defined culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administration. So um, the first one is actually asymmetrical race relation. So you find out that blackness, personifies a lack of evaluation skills and ignorance, while whiteness sign uh, sig signals what competence and what and knowledge. And, and, and you find out that um, this approach has also been in the, uh, in, internalized by us as Africans. You find out that if I take my mom to a black doctor, uh, she feels okay, but if I take it to a white doctor, she's much more happier. Our politicians, they do the same thing. They say one thing, but when they go to consult their lawyers, when they're in a tight space, they believe white lawyers or white attorneys are actually better than what than black what than black attorneys. And we have seen it in what in Africa. And you find out that a recent graduate with an undergrad degree is actually um, instructing someone else with a PhD in a specific area of work that they are working in. Why? Because of what of the asymmetrical race relations, and 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 and, and that um, that asymmetrical race relations. Now we have internalized it to the point that. As black people, at times we, we we tend to agree with it, although it is what it is actually quite wrong. So, 
so there's a component that was uh, raised by Paley in 2020 uh, about white gaze on development. So, so she defined white gaze on development as the white gaze of development is measuring black, brown, and non-white people against the standard of Northern whiteness and taking their political and economic social processes as a norm. So you find out that currently when you talk about development, we look at development from, Euro, uh, you, uh, from Eurocentric eyes to say, when you say we want African countries to actually be, to be fully developed, we are talking about the same conditions that are prevailing in, what, in the global north. But probably maybe that's not what the local people really want. Because if, for me, I understand in, in other communities, people feel like uh, I am because we are. It, it is more like um, if, I'm, if I'm a household that is food secure, living in a, in a community that is food insecure, then I have an obligation to share whatever I have with the rest of the community. So, so that kind of an approach to uh, those, those, kind of, those, those types of values now, they actually go against the, the individualistic nature of, uh, of development, uh, normally in the what in, um, that's, that that we normally see in um in in the Western what in the Western world. So probably maybe that's the reason why most of the development programs actually fail. Why? Because we are trying to fit a, a square peg in a round hole. We got probably as African communities, we got a specific way of viewing development. So, so you find out that that is the problem. And we have also seen it when it comes to even to, to our politics, liberal democracy, it has actually failed in Africa. We still persist with what we dictate us in other uh, key challenges what in, in, um, in politics. So, so you find out that in essence, um, the white gaze on development actually pushes the notion that white is always right and the West is always what the best, they always lead. And in this case, they lead because they are the ones who actually what, um, push a lot of uh, development aid to Africa. So, so there's also the issue of racial, uh, historical racial dimensions that are actually outdated. I think this point is actually quite, uh, quite interesting. So currently, when you talk about race, I think maybe it's, it's rising a little bit because of the critical race theories in the United States that is actually happening. You find out that um, the Western epistemological perspective argues that race, a personal attribute, that is, it, it, was, it is a personal attribute that is now outdated and misplaced. The progressive integration of personalized individual within modern political and, what, and economic spheres. So, so you, you, you find out that even in evaluations, we are no longer talking about the influence of, colo of colonization. You are not allowed to talk about it, even though you actually know that this particular problem was actually created by what? By colonization. This particular community is now vulnerable. Its food security is now vulnerable because they were moved during colonial period and they were never returned to their original lands that were fertile and productive. And it's actually, it's a colonial problem that has not been addressed, but you find out that you cannot talk about it in an evaluation and it becomes now what a problem. So, so most of the evaluation practitioners, they shun from talking about those things. Why? Because evaluators are, trans, um, are, um, are consultant. They want to make a living. If they go against the people who are commissioning evaluations, then it becomes what a problem. So right at the end, I got some few things um, that I just highlighted to say that when, when you look in terms of African evaluation, um, it actually suffers from, uh, from Eurocentricism. It's actually tailored towards what Eurocentric ways of doing things. And also evaluation is being laid by non-locals. It's also a big problem that, that is actually there in, what, in, um, in, in Africa. And then most development intervention could be considered a racial project because they create or reproduce the structures of domination based on racial uh, significance and, and identities. So it's more like they're just perpetuating um, the colonial system that we actually left intact um, at, uh, when, when, um, when colonized it ended. So evaluators also do not deal with, um, uh, with the elephant in the room. That is what the issue of race. So there's um, something that you call made in Africa evaluation or MAE. Um, it's, a, it's a thing that started around, um, around 2010. So it's just a concept that seeks to identify and develop a unique African approach to evaluation. It emphasizing that context, culture, history, beliefs, and values shape the nature of, evalu of evaluations. 
specifically in the diverse and often complex African reality. So that's what we call made in Africa evaluation. I know this definition actually goes against the issue of value-free evaluation and stuff like that. But from our perspective, we feel that the context, the culture, the history, and the beliefs of the people actually shape the nature of evaluations. Why? Because we believe that um, if a, 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 someone else is implementing a development program, they only provide the resources, but it's up to the people who are receiving those resources to actually say, this is what I'm going to do with these particular resources. And normally people who are doing the implementation, they don't have control over that. And how people use those resources is actually a matter, is actually influenced by context, culture, history, and what and beliefs. So, so, so that's what we call made in Africa evaluation. And there are some, um, there are some key things that are there. Uh, the first, the principle is actually powerful for Africans. This is more of something that is actually grounded in the African context and then supposed to be technically robust. We are not advocating for something that is actually quite weak. We want something that is technically robust, something that is ethically sound, and something that is what Africa-centric and yet open. We want something that is actually based on the worldview of, what, of Africans and also connected to the world. We understand that we cannot go on this alone, but we should be connected to the broader world. So there are some key issues for consideration. The first key issue is more like a recommendation. The first one is actually transformative thinking by development funders. So for us to address this particular problem, I think development funders should be, should be the ones to actually say what is actually wrong with our approach so that they can actually have some sort of a transformative thinking when it comes to, what, to, uh, to international development. And also the second recommendation is that rooting development programs into the social historic context. We know that social historic context is very critical in influencing the success or failures of, of a development program. And then there are issues that we always pay lip service to, participatory program designs. You don't want a program that has been designed somewhere, then someone comes and just implement it. So we want participatory design, participatory implementation, participatory monitoring, and participatory evaluation by the people who are benefiting from that particular program. Then the use of indigenous knowledge systems. Our communities are still uh, ingrained indigenous knowledge systems. So no matter how you bring in new knowledge systems, you'll find out that people still resort to the indigenous knowledge system. So, 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 so we have our own way of knowing. Um, and our vow, and, and our worldviews and also values and cultures. So those ones are supposed to be factored in, especially in, in evaluation. And then there's something that is called ethnographic monitoring. I think most of the development, international development organization, they are stuck in specific indicators. And uh, those indicators, they're also taken for evaluation. And you find out that anything else that does not conform to the evaluation is not even what, is not even considered. Um, uh, even though it actually affects um, the program. So it also becomes what we, we, we are advocating for something that is what we call eth ethnographic monitoring. When you do ethnographic monitoring, you really engage yourself, embed yourself in the communities to actually see what is actually happening when, when actually introduce this particular intervention. Even at what at small case studies, in most cases, you find out that whatever you get from there is actually going to be something that is quite interesting. And I think this is based on, um, on the work that has been done by anthropologists, uh, ethnographers in South America, in Africa. I think those are the people who actually brought in a new understanding of specific communities. And then the last part is actually Global North uh, funders, program implementers, they should actually be aware of their own biases, their power and their privilege. So in ten, a, a, at times they might not even show that they've got power. But from my perspective, I also view them as some people with what with power, and we've seen it even at what um, at people who are actually very good evaluators who are based in Africa. When we have con personal conversations with them, they will tell you that they fear the power of what of the international community, and so so you find out that they don't say specific things, no matter how they feel about them, because what because they know that whoever they are talking about actually has got power to what um, to end their what their evaluation career. So I'm going to end here. Uh, thank you. And I will be able to take questions.
Good morning, this is Nikki. Um, thanks for putting your session together for us this morning. I have a question about, um, uh, as an indigenous person, I think we talk a lot about defunding, um, defunding um, foundations and, and, and people and things that, you know, uh, may be well known for uh, hurting our land, uh, not upholding treaty rights and those types of things. So I always find myself in this really peculiar situation or tension. Um, you know, so ExxonMobil, for instance, has lots of environmental disasters, but they have a very uh, uh, active um, foundation, you know, that people receive funds from. And I'm just, on it, I'm just curious, uh, you know, how you, what goes on in your head and how do you, think about accepting money from places you know that feel colonized you know but you know you use the funding for very important community programming so i'm just trying to sh i'm trying to share with a brother like come tell me tell me where you're at with these things maybe it'll help <laughs> and good morning <laughs> Uh, good morning, Nikki. Uh, so, so let me respond to that. It's an interesting take here. Um, so for me, from my side, I feel like um, there's nothing wrong with accepting the money. But the problem starts when the money comes with, with specific conditions. Um, that's probably, as an implementer or as an evaluator, I, where, where I feel like I'm not making any, what, any impact in this particular what. Um, even with this what with this money that's where the problem is to say um there's some great ideas that are there that just need what specific funding um it doesn't matter where the money comes from it might be coming from china it might be coming from the worst environmental polluters but the issue is actually that uh, the conditions are the ones that actually what um that are that affects especially the outcome of that particular money it should, it should be money that that should actually make what make an impact. And I think most of the foundation, they should actually start thinking about impact, not necessarily how much money have you actually given and how much of that money has been what accounted for. Because I think that's that's the key goal currently is that we got 300 million US dollars. We have given uh, 250 to, to African countries. We can, we can account for all the 250 million. That's what they want. They are not talking about what, about impact. So we need to actually, make those foundations actually start thinking about impact. How can this money actually make an impact or change in this particular community? I think that's what we all want. Not necessarily um, to say account, account, uh, um, accountability is the key issue, but impact should be actually be the key issue. Are we making an impact in these particular communities? Because I'm sure you can keep on giving money every year, people are accounting for it, but then you discover after 30 years that you're not making an impact. Then it means that money was what? It was, uh, it, it was more of where? Uh, it, it, it was wasted. So to answer your question, whatever money is coming from, people are happy with it. But the issue actually becomes what with the conditions. What kind of impact am I supposed to actually make? And this is supposed to come from the foundation because if the foundation dictates that I want to see this specific impact in your community, then we are all happy. But that's not the case actually currently. I can give you one of the programs that I worked on, on maternal health. You'll find out that for monitoring, we, we actually produced quite a number of comprehensive indicators that we knew that these indicators will actually point us towards impact. And then when we submitted, we were only told, ah, no, we only want nine indicators. These nine, these indicators, how many people are you actually reaching? How many family methods uh, are you, uh, are you actually distributing? And then that was it. So everything else that we're learning from the particular program, they didn't want anything to do with it. So it actually became what, a big what, a big problem. So it's those type of, um, of conditions that actually make that particular funding not make an impact. And it actually goes into evaluation. As an evaluator, someone who doesn't have any, any work for the next six months, if someone comes with 35 days to say, I want you to do one, two, three, four, five things, I can't even propose new methodologies. Well, why? Because problem, I don't even get the job. So I also want to eat. So it's, it's, it's that, kind of, that kind of approach. So it's the approach to giving out that money that is, what, that is quite critical. Thank you. Thank you. 
There are a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is from Aneta. How, how has the Made in, in Africa approach been received by the international development community? So, so that's an interesting question. Eh? But I think we, I can say we have hit a paper patch because we, we have been talking with a number of foundations. Um, they are now actually starting thinking about how can they actually transform the way they do things? Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, it's, it's because of a number of factors that, is, that, are actually what, um, that are actually at play. But I think we, we all understand that um, issues to do with um, race is actually, it came up um, a few years ago, and actually quite a number of organizations now, they're actually cognizant of the fact that they really need to, transfer the, um, to transform the way they do things. Maybe probably there were no platforms where people can actually tell them to say, um, your power is actually, um, you, 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 you are not even minding the power that you have to the extent that you are not listening to the people, um, uh, to the people you are trying to help. So, so you find out that quite a number of organizations, they are now talking about it. I think you've heard about um, cultural sensitive evaluations, uh, cultural competencies. We have heard about transforma uh, transforming evaluations, uh, issues to do with gender equity. So, so all those things are actually now coming up. Um, and, and, and I think it's a response to, uh, to the cry from the global south, especially with regards to the approach to international development. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting space now because things are actually shaping up and actually changing. Um, we, we are now moving from saying, um, I'm giving you this man, I want you to do one, two, three, four, five things. It's more now to say, give me your idea so that I can decide if I can, what, if I can find you. So that's, that's the kind of an approach that is actually what, um, that, is happening, that is currently happening. And it's very, what, um, and it's actually very interesting. So, so it's gaining traction. I think in the past five years, they've been gaining traction and it's quite interesting. Thank you. And the other question um, I see in the chat here, it says, um, well, the message says, thank you, Stephen, for your insights and valuable message. Glad to reconnect with you after many months. Looking at the implications, we lost our epistemic freedom. How can we bring it back and teach African ways of knowing and being to, the, to spur the made in Africa evaluation? Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's a difficult question because I feel like um, I think it's um, like, like it's saying what you say in Africa. We, you, if you want to eat an elephant, uh, you eat one piece at a time. Uh, you don't go for the whole for the whole elephant, or else you're not going to be what to be successful. So, so the issue is actually that um, um, we there's actually need for us to actually think about something that is actually what realistic. If we're saying we want to do a made in Africa evaluation, then we really need to actually say, hey, when you talk about made in Africa evaluation, these are the methodologies that you can actually use. This is how you can actually use this methodology to do an, an, an evaluation. Um, as, composed, as compared to just highlighting what um, the specific um, problem without actually offering uh, the solution to the problem. So I think we, we, we have reached a point now where we are actually where we, are sub, where we are starting to, to produce those methodologies, to produce the solutions to the current problems that we are seeing, especially when it, come to, when it comes to, uh, to decolonization. So, 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 so what I can say, my response to Andon is actually that um, we need to provide specific solutions that actually challenge the status quo. Um, complaining alone is not gonna work because obviously someone's gonna say, but what are the made in Africa evaluation methodologies? Tell me one methodology, how do I use it? Tell me the evaluation that you have done using what made in Africa evaluation. So, so it, it, it boils down to that. And if we don't provide those particular tools, methodologies, then we are actually not going to make what any, um, any progress. People will just view us as people who are just complaining about specific things, but they don't have solutions to those particular problems. So. I think we are, we we are now we have now reached a, a, a space where we need to be very practical in terms of when you talk about this is how we take our epistemic freedom back. This is how we, how you do it, and and, and I think um, I'm happy because Anon, Anon is one of the authors who actually contributed an article to the special edition. So uh, he was also talking about these issues. So it's um it's quite interesting. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah. Do we have any other questions or messages for Stephen? Um, I just want to say a, a huge thank you. That was um, a really incredible presentation. And I know personally, I, I got a lot from it. And it's um, definitely an area that I will be looking into a bit more um, as there seems to be a lot of, of a lot of learning in this space. So really, thank you for your time and um, your knowledge that you've shared today. Okay, thank you. Okay, I got another question. <laughs> so thinking about our funders and trying to look over time, even if it's just the last few years, are you finding, you know, I want to go back to like funding and defunding. And are you able to leverage any partnerships? So when you work with fill in the blank foundation, they actually want to know your perspective or the evaluators perspective, you know, on what is impact or what are biocultural indicators or do you have any opportunity to work with the folks that fund you because they're actually trying to move more towards diversity, equity and inclusion. That's just the mm. latest buzzword. I'm old enough. So I've heard lots of buzzwords. Mm. I will take that <laughs> those decades of my experience. So I am qualified to say that. Um, mm. uh, and I'm seeing a, I in the global north am seeing a few more of our foundations actually hire and work with evaluators of color to help mm. their capacity building around this area and they are very open to say a medicine wheel or seven directions framework or different indigenous or culturally responsive frameworks are you seeing that it would be nice mm -hmm. i want to hear some hope coming from the philanthropic world too i hope you're mm -hmm. seeing that as well yeah so thank you for that so currently the send i'm working uh, i'm working for we we are working with ford foundation they just said we understand you are in this particular area. You want to develop some stuff for equitable evaluation. Here's the funding. Can you do something around that area? So, 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 so that funding, I think um, we just started the grant just now. It's actually going to produce um, uh, some guidelines in terms of how to actually doing uh, what we call equitable evaluation or evaluation in service of, in service of equity. This is now from, from an African perspective. Um, and I think we are primed to do that because we work in a number of African countries. So, so, so that's, it. that's one thing. And also we are going to be developing some, some curriculum for equitable evaluation to say, if you want to do um, equitable evaluation, we can train you and then we can also give you opportunities to do that. So, so it's, um, it's gaining traction and it's, um, it's one of the interesting projects, um, especially for Matt from a funder who just say, yes, the money address this, this specific problem that you say you actually have in, what, in, in, in African countries. So, so, so that work will, spill, uh, will spill, uh, spill into the government departments and also into, what, into the international development space. So it's something that is quite interesting. And um, that specific approach, I think is, we are starting to actually to see it with a number of, of organizations wanting to partner with us. Some of them, they'll say, we want you to give technical assistance to specific organization in terms of uh, how to do things in a more appropriate way. Uh, or maybe train some organizations around what, how do they actually do, deal with issues of, what, of equity in monitoring, equity in what, in, especially in the evaluation space. How do they actually develop a transformative terms of reference for a specific evaluation? So, so we, are, we are starting to see um, uh, traction around those particular areas. And um, it's actually encouraging for us because I think people started talking about Made in Africa more than 10 years ago, but uh, I think it died down. There were only something like maybe five or six publication around it, but I think currently they are also increasing um, in different forms. Uh, some people, they might, they, they would like to call it transformative evaluation, but we know that it all goes back to what, um, to Made in Africa. Um, yeah. So, so there is actually a lot of traction around that, uh, around that area. And um, I think 
we we need more 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 approaches like that. Yeah, thank you. And with just a shameless plug, we would love to hear posts or see things from you on our IPE TIG or Eval Indigenous about this curriculum, you know, made mm -hmm. in Africa, the that you're doing. That would be wonderful. We could share. And and I guess secondly, just to bring more visibility, maybe next year, mm -hmm. you know, you bring Ford Foundation or those of us who are working and you have, mm. we talked about that. I wish more foundations could see what other foundations are doing and maybe it would, mm. you know, spark some interest, yeah. but really, really great work down there and really interesting, but share mm. away on our social media. We love, we love mm. reading about mm. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yep. Mm. Do we still have any more questions? Just, just, just to clarify one thing, because I know there's um there's that um way people actually a misunderstanding around um, decolonization. When we talk about decolonization, we are not saying that we should go back to uh, pre-colonization period. We we are just talking about um we 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 know we have moved on, but we 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 are talking about actually about the current present um also maybe understanding our our history our beliefs our culture the all matter and even our values and actually how we perceive the world i think is one of the most what important things because we when we look at the world we look at it from what from a from a different angle um and um that's what we are just saying to say um even when you when you when you when you find a specific program the people who are receiving it, they are not viewing it from your perspective. They are viewing it in a completely different way. And in most cases, the failure to actually factor that in actually leads to uh, the, pro, uh, uh, the, uh, the program even not, 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 not performing quite well. So, so, so is that kind of what, that kind of an approach? Because I think one person actually asked me to say, oh, you want us to go to the pre-colonial era. No, we are not going back to the pre-colonial era. We're done with the pre-colonial era. Um, so, so, so that's uh, just maybe what a point of what uh, of clarification there. Thank you. See that Deborah has a question. Hi. Good morning. Actually, I have a, yeah. a response, but thank you so much, Stephen, for doing this and for presenting to each of us at these very bizarre times. Um, in, in more ways than one. Uh, I, want, I was just in wanting to respond, Nikki, to your invitation to, for to Stephen to, to post more with the indigenous TIG. That it, it occurs to me that there's the foundations TIG and that maybe a joint presentation for next year's um, conference might be really a very valuable uh, contribution mm -hmm. to them. Uh, and I don't know if there have they has that been done? Are you aware? Um, is anybody aware if there's been any joint presentations between the indigenous TIG and the foundations? None in the 25 years that I can remember, but I don't have a great memory. But we, you know, I think that we probably could bring Robert Wood Johnson Foundation along. Um, but I think it would be a, I think it would be a powerful and amazing presentation because there's a lot of mutual love and respect, reciprocal learning, and proof that there can be uh, a multi-ethnic, multi-intersectional yeah. uh, way that we can do this work differently. You know, and I yeah. think sometimes people can see that and be inspired by that by the storytelling of which we can talk about impact as well. That 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 may be something that will that will boost some, you know, indigeneity and love and life in into the work because it's really a it's a challenging space, uh, but it's not draining. Um, it's very no. it's mm -hmm. there's lots of moments of joy, lots of moments of wow. People really are 
including the grantees you get to work with, they're vibing using this new model. Oh, mm -hmm. we never thought about this. And I'm telling you, the grantees are from all spaces and walks of life and ages and everything. So I think that would be super cool to be able to do. Well, mm -hmm. and I just mm -hmm. wanted to say that I years ago, I was a program chair. I was the nonprofit. It's called the Foundations and Nonprofit TIG. Mm -hmm. And I was the nonprofit voice among many foundations. But mm -hmm. um, I think they were really hungry to have that conversation with their it's it's a safe place to have a conversation between people who are receiving the dollars and people who are giving the dollars and um and dollar or whatever kind of money whatever kind of monies it is um mm. and i just it just occurred to me that that might be a very rich space to have even sort of a subcommittee of that of you know a joint group Mm -hmm. Stephen, we got to get it written into your Ford Foundation money so mm -hmm. you can travel for just, I mean, I think a lot yes, of dissemination yeah. and sense making of data is mm -hmm. super important. And considering Madame President Veronica this year, mm -hmm. we, you know, like, oh, she would have <laughs> liked that. You know, there's always next year. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We, we actually have a budget for that. So oh. we, we are up for, uh, for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for that suggestion, Deborah. I think um, hope we're, I think there's a hope for that, that there will be more collaborations thinking along the philanthropic and foundation sector. And just a plug that one of our uh, keynotes at this year's conference is going to be Edgar Villanueva, who is uh, a leader in the yeah. philanthropic sector talking yeah. about decolonizing wealth. Um, and so we're really excited for that. So hopefully that'll spark even more conversations around this topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, feedback? We could have made morning yoga part of the mm. sesh this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, everyone. And thank you, Stephen, for putting this together. It, it was it, exciting to see the, the dialogue it created among all of you. It sounds like there's... Um, lots of exciting things to come from this too with all the collaborations hopefully mm, yeah Great, thank you all so much for joining um, and keep an eye out for our uh, next presentation in this series and Anita, do you have the date for that on hand? I do not, but it will be um, shared through the the IPE TIG Facebook page, um, as well as I think there'll be an um, email uh, to what? Yeah, as well. Okay, I want to say October 7th. Sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.